but it, it goes beyond eating and digesting. To be clear, those are some of the, the more important reactions, right? Like you have to take things in, break them down, reposition, rebond the atoms to create things that you need. Um, there's a whole lot more going on there too. So the hummingbird and all living things is an excellent example of that. Why is that the case? Why would a hummingbird require many metabolic reactions, including those that break down large molecules? Yeah. Good. Yeah, so um, any organism needs to be able to convert energy from one form to another in order to be able to stay alive, maintain homeostasis, do things like fly, right? So a hummingbird uses a lot of energy to flap those wings. You, um, have you ever seen a hummingbird not flying? They're cute. I mean, they, 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 they perch on trees and they're like this big. They're, they're really cute. I mean, but they're... They, they fly a lot. So they're essentially going from flower to flower or for man-made feeder collecting energy. So if they're going from flower to flower, what, what is their food source? Let's see. Nectar. Yeah, nectar. What is nectar? Pollen. Sugars. Sugars, right? So carbohydrates. Um, this feeder right here is probably um, table sugar, sucrose, and water. Anybody recall what type of uh, carbohydrate uh, sucrose is? Uh, disaccharide, so it's two monosaccharides chained together. Um, and so the hummingbird will perform what type of reaction to break those disaccharides down into monosaccharides? Catabolic. Okay, so yeah, we're getting into some new terminology there. I'm sort of referring back to a specific reaction where you break the links between individual monomers. Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, good, yeah. So it's going to perform a hydrolysis reaction, and it's going to have monosaccharides. And then what would that this organism do with those monosaccharides? So in other words, is a monosaccharide, is that kind of molecule energy? It's not, right? And so that's, that's sort of a common misconception. People say food is energy. Well, sure, but there's a couple of steps after that because um, our cells are not using glucose um, as a source of energy, right? It's converting those sugars into what? ATP, right? And so then you get some cellular respiration. You're talking about what a mitochondrion does. Um, but anything that's alive, any current version of an organism, is very good at transferring energy from one form to another. It has to be. Otherwise, what would have happened to it? Unable to function and live. Yeah, so its fitness would have been low. Nature would have selected against it, and it would be extinct, right? What's going on here? Giving you like a little bit of a general biology sort of feeling for the start here. Hummingbirds flying. What kind of tree is that on the left? Oak. Okay, good. You guys know your trees. <laughs> the other class was like, that's an acorn tree. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. Have you ever heard of an acorn tree? You know, and I know what they mean, you know, but um, oak trees, you can't see the leaves here, so that's also sort of not there, but an oak tree puts out these acorns, right? And there's a lot of oak trees in this area, right? You can hear them thumping down on your car. You see that people have dri driven over them and crushed them. So how does an oak tree then convert energy from one form to another to stay alive? Oh, good, photosynthesis. So in the case of this tree, like other organisms that make their own food. What do we call an organism that makes its own food? Autotroph. Autotroph, right? 
So autotrophs have an interesting series of chemical reactions called photosynthesis, where they can convert solar energy into stored chemical energy in the form of glucose. glucose. Sugar, sugar glucose, yeah. Sugar, right, and you get that monosaccharide and then you can chain together that monosaccharide and maybe if you have excess, you make starch, you know, use a little bit to make cellulose so that you're standing tall and pointing towards the sun. But um, autotrophs feed themselves through photosynthesis. Do autotrophs then have to convert that sugar into ATP? They do, right? So a common misconception, even at the AP level, is that, you know, autotrophs do photosynthesis and heterotrophs, like squirrels and us, do cell respiration. But these guys are making their food and breaking their food, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Now this heterotroph over here can take some of that stored chemical energy from the tree, eat it, and convert it into ATP that it can use, right? Squirrels are very good at that. What did you say? They're thieves. They're thieves, yeah. And depending on where you are, they can be very friendly or could care less, right? But um, like city squirrels are very, they interact with people a lot, so they're not as afraid. Um, and I'll, I'll say a brief story because I've said it in the other two classes and it's interesting, but um, the squirrels in Swickley are unlike any other squirrel that I have seen for a couple of reasons, but one I'll point out, does anybody, first of all, does anybody know like what makes a Swickley squirrel different than um, other squirrels? It's a phenotype that I, that I've only noticed in, in Swickley squirrels. Their bellies are rust colored. So it's not like a light brown, like this is a gray squirrel, right? And its coat is gray, but their bellies are usually light brown. This, the ones in Swickley, they stand out, they're orange, which is just an interesting aside. Okay, so we're gonna get into some specific types of reactions now. We'll distinguish between anabolic and catabolic, exergonic and endergonic. Um, these two figures should look similar. It's similar to the, the figures that we've used in the past to describe um, on the top here, dehydration reactions, just take together monomers them together to make polymers and over here hydrolysis reactions that uh, utilize chemical reactions to break these polymers down into their individual components we can also say that these ones here that lead from smaller units to larger ones with the help of energy are anabolic and those that break those polymers down into smaller subunits are catabolic okay so um how are we going to remember that i'll tell you my mnemonic device um, when I hear the term anabolic as a baseball fan, I automatically think of anabolic steroids, right? Baseball players are like known for taking roids. Um, and what is it? Why would one take anabolic steroids? To create muscle, right? So I sort of think of like going from Mark McGuire in the 19, 1987, where he was like a stick figure, to like Mark McGuire in the mid 90s where his forearms were like the size of most people's thighs. Like um, you're taking that, that smaller and you're building up, right? Catabolic, I think it's, I think it's um, Greek or Latin for casting aside, so casting down. So you're taking those individual units and you're casting them down into the single subunits. But um, some of the keys here is that it takes energy to construct things. And oftentimes when you're breaking things down, it releases energy. That's going to set the stage for us in a moment when we talk about exergonic and endergonic reactions. Okay, so on the top there, that chemical reaction, if that's occurring inside your cells, which of the following is it? Is it anabolic or catabolic? Anabolic, anabolic because you're going from individuals, taking some energy, joining them together to make a disaccharide. Um, very similar to the dehydration reactions that we've looked at before. The opposite is shown below. You're showing the separation of those two um, joined together monomers and the disaccharide breaking it down with the water, right? So hydrolysis is what type of reaction? Anabolic or catabolic? Catabolic. Yeah. Okay. So all of these scenarios that we're covering 
this setting this up this discussion up of energy which is the second half of this um, second unit for us it's the third unit for ap biology um, this third unit is cellular energetics so really everything in here is about energy so i want to have a couple of discussions about energy and how it transforms in a biological sense that's going to require us to do so, you know basic chemistry and basic physics but it's really important as we set up cellular respiration and photosynthesis so again if you're looking at this um, image of a, a moose feeding um, what can you tell me about some of the transformations of energy in this picture what's an example of an of transforming energy yeah let's if you can start at the beginning um the sunlight the energy from the sun is then translated on to it helps the tree grow like the photosynthesis. good yeah we we um, had mentioned that this transition here from solar energy and the stored chemical energy in the form of carbohydrates is photosynthesis so photosynthesis uh, can help an organism like this autotroph this this tree here to feed itself by converting that energy good so you know the catch to that is like all of life whether directly or indirectly depends on what source them the sun right so even if you're a, a second level heterotroph the things that you eat or the things that you eat what they eat require the sun to feed themselves right so that's a little preview for ecology when we get there but um, what's going on with the heat loss so in that diagram you're seeing uh, an arrow going to create chemical energy stored as sugar but what's with the arrow coming off that reaction Very great. Yeah. So we're already bringing up thermodynamics, which is, which is amazing. So you're right. Um, no reaction is 100% efficient. And consequently, uh, oftentimes the energy that's lost that creates to this uh, increase in entropy is heat, right? And so living systems, heat is lost. So you lose some of the energy to the environment, which creates that entropy, that disorganization. And we see that at every, every transition. Right, so as you're going from sunlight to sugar, as you're going from sugar to ATP, right, we're losing some energy in the form of heat there, supporting the second law, which is great. So the moose can then eat the leaves, convert that energy, helping uh, cellular respiration create ATP. The ATP can be used to convert, um, you know, to help an animal to move. Right, so. In biology, a lot of times the reactions that need to occur um, need energy to do so. So we're going to talk about that in the next couple of slides. Well, like, how do you get a reaction that doesn't necessarily want to happen? How do you encourage it to happen? Or how do you get the energy for it to happen? Uh, one of those things is the mechanical movement. So we'll talk about how ATP does that. Same idea in this picture, except we're building in this idea of decomposers. So decomposers play a, a really important role in um, converting energy, right? So you take a, a large mass of organic molecules like a dead moose. That dead moose lies down in the woods and eventually the bacteria, the fungi, they come and they break it down, right? As it's doing that, as it's digesting what's left of the moose, it's going to release heat. It'll release monomers back into the soil. Um, a lot of the, the way that I do ecology, it's um, I don't we don't have time at the end to to like do an ecology unit. So I've sprinkled it in throughout the curriculum, just to keep those ideas uh, going. So one of these is like cycling of nutrients. You won't have to explicitly tell me about the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle, but you should understand that all these things um, cycle through ecosystems. Okay, so this is a, an evolution link that I often like to make. Again, we would have had evolution at this point in time in a normal year. 
but um, evolution has invented um, different systems for producing energy. Now at the very bottom there, the prokaryotic ancestor, that's colored one way. Everything else is colored predominantly, what is that, salmon? Salmon color. And then you have the U bacteria, the true bacteria, a third different color. So thinking about early earth and the atmospheric conditions that existed at that time, what sort of energy producing system would have to be in place for our prokaryotic ancestors to be able to, to produce energy? Would it involve oxygen? It would not because very early on, you know, over the 4 billion years of life, um, Earth did not have a whole lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. So a lot of these organisms would be, what's the sort of energy system that doesn't use oxygen? When you put an in front of something, it makes it not something. So if cellular respiration is aerobic, what, anaerobic. anaerobic yeah so you have anaerobic energy building processes eventually giving way once the atmospheric oxygen levels were high enough to aerobic processes so if you look at um you know that primary uh, thread of life protists plants animals fungi those organisms are um, aerobic so they utilize oxygen as do a lot of archaea. What about this guy over here, though? I mean, it's not, it's not just one guy. It's actually quite a few um, different forms of life. What's with the true bacteria? For them, energy production is contextual. So if you are a bacterium that um, grows uh, deep in the soil, deep in earth, are you aerobic or anaerobic? Probably an, just because the uh, the uh, amount of oxygen that you need is, is not quite high enough at that point of the earth. Um, there's an idea of like, well, this organism is um, an obligate anaerobe, or it's an obligate aerobic organism. What does it mean to be obligated? A little bit of English. What is it? Required. required, yeah. So when you're an obligate anaerobe, you're required to be anaerobic. For organisms that are obligate anaerobes, the moment they are exposed to oxygen, they die, right? So same thing reversed for an obligate aerobic. But there's a term called facultative. What does the term facultative mean then? So yeast can be facultative. Um, a, a yeast is um, a fungi. Um, but I'm using that as an example. There are some bacteria that can do this. When you're facultative, you can take advantage of whatever the environment provides. So, you know, if you find yourself in an oxygenated environment, you can do aerobic. If you're not in an oxygenated environment, you can shift and do um, anaerobic. So those organisms are, are interesting over there. Now, just going back to this, if I said, you know, our ancestors of all of life, they were anaerobic. What does that mean about potentially life downstream of that? Yeah. Well, slowly over time, it became aerobic mm -hmm. because uh, once that lower aerobic had the, uh, like the better trait where it was not one that became anaerobic. Um, so, so organisms that became aerobic, their fitness, their ability to survive and reproduce and pass on their genes increased in that oxygenated environment. And you're right, it makes sense that you would sort of give way to that process. But it's like, um, you know, operating systems on a computer, right? There's a lot of background systems operating. And if a certain system isn't like preventing the computer from working, those systems can operate in the background, right? So if being having the capability to be anaerobic 
wasn't lowering your fitness, would it would it stand to reason that you could still have that anaerobic ability? In fact, wouldn't having the option to do that in the absence of oxygen probably increase your fitness? Yeah, so for animals like us, can we be aerobic then, anaerobic? Certain cells can, so overall humans can go anaerobic. What would be an instance in which your intake of oxygen was lower or insufficient for the amount of ATP you needed? If you're like working out pretty hard, you know, um, all that lactic acid, right? Um, the muscles. Yeah. So like if you're on a cross country team, right. And you're, you're a hundred yards out and you have to put in like a, a strong kick at the end. Where is that coming from? If you're hopping and puffing after three miles or whatever, right. If you're sprinting the last half mile, you're probably going to go anaerobic. Um, if you're, if you're running fast enough, same thing, if you're being chased down by a lion, right or whatever hunted our ancestors, right? So the ability to kind of shift into that, albeit temporarily, right? If you, if you do that too long, you pass out and something gets you. But um, yeah, so it's just that, you know, doing things like this and trying to connect ideas to evolution, you should always be able to connect an idea back to evolution because everything that we're discussing, all these systems, all these pathways were enabled by what? Evolution, yeah. Okay, so is photosynthesis anabolic or catabolic? You have to kind of remind yourself of what are the reactants for photosynthesis here? And what are the products? And what are their energy states? Any takers? What goes in? Well, what, let's 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 ask a freshman bio question. What do you have to do to your plants to keep them alive? Water. You gotta water them. Um, you gotta give them some sunlight. Yeah, and make sure they're not like wrapped up in an airtight bag. I guess I don't know. Put them outside. Or something. So the um, the carbon dioxide, the water, those, those molecules in them themselves, they don't. There's not necessarily any free energy associated with them. But photosynthetic machinery in the chloroplast is able to create a high potential energy glucose molecule. So that makes that process what? Anabolic. Okay, we're going to shift over into a little, um, little bit of physics terms, and it's um, very little, very little. Um, yeah, so if you have like water positioned at a higher space than the river below and you allow the water to flow down right what does the water up high represent what sort of energy potential. potential energy yeah and as it goes from high to low same thing with the water falling down uh, what is that water becoming kinetic. kinetic and then once it gets to the, the bottom and it can't fall any further what sort of state is it in well, low energy, it has not much for the energy, right? So that is to say, like, as you're transforming energy, molecules or solutes, they're going to they're gonna transition from high potential energy to kinetic to low potential energy. Now, it stands to reason that you can go from low potential energy back to high potential energy. Why is that? What is uh, some some evidence that you could provide for reasoning? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's a good that's a good sort of physical example. What about a biological? I would offer up the evidence that all of you were here. You know, low potential energy things can be generated. In fact, I would probably argue that 
life is all about taking low energy things and re reinvesting energy to make them back into high potential energy things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could be a situation where yeah, you're you're transforming it in that case and you're probably losing some on the way to ATP, but you know, ATP in of itself is still high potential energy. But ATP in of itself is a good example, right? Because when ATP is hydrolyzed, the hydrolysis of ATP creates ADP and phosphate. Right, ADP and phosphate relative to ATP, is it high potential energy or low? ADP. Low. Yeah, low potential energy in ADP, but all of life pretty much functions on the ability to take that ADP and phosphate to recouple the phosphate and make ATP. So it goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, but that's that's just one example. Like everything that we're talking about is an example of that. Okay, here are some examples of that. Um, it's almost like I planned this, right? Like I sat down one day and I said, huh, if I could teach students about diffusion osmosis and then talk about it as an, as an energy system, boy, would that make me look smart? Maybe, right? But what's going on in this, in this um, membrane picture? You have a high concentration uh, of solute, whatever it is, on one side of the biological membrane, and it seems to be going down the concentration gradient to the other side. So at which point in that membrane is there the greatest amount of potential energy? On the far left, where the greatest concentration, right? Concentration gradients have a high amount of potential energy, right? And then as the solutes or whatever they are start to transition, they become kinetic, they go from one side to the other, right? the situation ultimately becomes where there's low potential energy because you've reached what in the figure? Equilibrium, Equilibrium right? And so going back to our previous um, discussion on ATP, um, this, you know, we don't allow this to happen in ourselves. We need this to utilize the energy, whatever ha whatever is happen happening there. So this can be undone and we can create that concentration gradient again. Good. What about in the bottom part, the uh, the chemistry example? So it looks to me like you have two monosaccharides, they're bound together to a disaccharide. And then what happens? Yeah, they're broken down back into their monosaccharides. Does this require energy? Very little. Very little, but it does. You know, and then you could say technically the energy is stored in those bonds between the monosaccharides and that energy can be released with the breaking of the bond, right? You spent one or two years at this point in time in chemistry talking about things like that. But again, these are two examples that, um, that cells utilize to um, keep that ability to, to um, transform energy possible. Okay, we'll offer another sort of physics, physical science example. Which person in this picture has the greatest amount of potential energy? The diver, the one that... Ah. Yeah, so he, you know, you can make an argument, well, it's probably about the same, or this guy's this much further down than this guy, right? So I don't know if you, still do this in physics or whatever, but, um, you know, which has more potential energy, like this one or this one? I don't know if you can see me. So this one, right? Um, so this guy has been made kinetic. How do you know that there's, a, that the energy is doing something for, for this person? Silly questions, but I mean, they're, they're falling, right? I mean, they're, they're moving. How could you measure the amount of kinetic energy in that person at either this point in time, this point in time, this point in time? 
yeah which we which we will not thank god we will not get into i'm saying like just conceptually you know how could you tell that there's a lot of stored energy here and that the energy is released upon becoming kinetic i'll tell you a good way a belly flop you ever do a belly flop when you belly flop what happens Water flies, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's true. Well, it first, I mean, it, it really hurts, right? Like, whenever somebody does a belly flop, what's the first reaction everybody gets? Oh, Ooh. you know, why, why do they say that? Because the transference of the potential energy up here to the ground below that really hurts, you know. So and at that point in time, the person is as far down as they can be in this scenario. So their, their amount of potential energy is what? Yeah, zero or very, very low, whatever. Okay, so it's like the same thing with, with you know, the balls, like more potential energy, less, but when they're at rest, both of them have no potential energy. Right? Well, in this scenario, again, can you regenerate the potential energy? Yeah, you do what? You so this thing I did, I'm going to redeem myself and get back on the, the platform again and you belly flop again. What did it take if you are down at the bottom with no energy to get back up into that potentially energetic state? Energy. energy. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, again, it's just, a, it's a biological theme that we are often harnessing energy by going from high to low, by breaking bonds. And at some point you're at a lower potentially energetic state, but it stands to reason that because we're continue, continuing to exist, we can regenerate that high potential energy, but sometimes it costs you energy to do that, right? You know the expression, it takes money to make money? Well, it takes a little bit of energy to make energy. I mean, it must give you more energy in the end Otherwise, that that you know that balance sheet doesn't work out, right? Okay. What's this? A car? Right? No. <laughs> Anybody know what this is? It does say it. It does say what it is. So listen, in this class, if I ever cold call on you, you panic, just either it's usually going to be a title or it's going to be like, there's going to be text on there. As you just start reading, the molecule of gasoline. Um, right? Just telling you that right out. There's always, usually going to be some, some text up there. Yeah, so what, is this, what does this remind you of biologically? What sort of molecule? It does remind you of a fatty acid chain, doesn't it? Yeah, so it's carbon surrounded by hydrogen, right? And so if you were Mr. Gallagher, you would just chop these two carbon chunks up. Anybody know what molecule you'd make? I mean, it's not exactly in this picture because it's gasoline, but you know, all roads of energy production lead to Acetyl CoA. So we'll get there, but like, yeah. So can you eat gasoline? Can. <laughs> Why not? I wouldn't recommend it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, Mr. Gallagher ain't only these, and he's okay. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, high performance race cars with um, internal combustion engines, they can convert that gasoline into an energy source that can move it, right? I mean, they've designed it to do this uh, sort of thing, just like or, um, organisms have evolved to do the same thing, right? And if we put side by side the things that go into a car and the things that a cell utilizes, um, yeah, one's gasoline and one is glucose in this particular example. But the idea is the same, okay? It's energy conversion, using the energy to do something and spitting out the byproducts that are low energy, okay? Um, 
of course, just like in the cells in the pictures that we saw before, none of these reactions are 100% efficient. So you're never gonna use 100% uh, of all of your gasoline energy when you're, when you're running this car. How do you know that? Like, how could you determine that? What are the signs that a car is not 100% efficient? Due to various physical forces, yeah. Well, sure, yeah. I mean, then you just got a lemon or jalopy, right? It gives off heat, right? And so you can see this a lot in the in the uh, winter time when it's colder outside. So you see the difference. But if you put your hand on a on the hood of a car, it's hot, right? So that's energy loss in the in the engine. Now I am not an engine car nut sort of guy, but I can say the following. It's, um, you know, uh, internal combustion engine, so it needs oxygen to break it down. Then the pistons inside the engine start pumping. Apparently that does something where, you know, you, you, um, you turn the axle, which turns the wheel, right, you go. What else are you getting on the back end, literally, of the car? Yeah, yeah gasoline and water, the byproducts, the same byproducts of um, uh, carbon dioxide and water. Same byproducts, by the way, of what process? Cellular respiration, right? So our cells, you know, they have this um, internal combustion engine where you can convert highly energetic, potentially energetic molecules into a usable form of, of energy that can do cell work. You use some as heat, but you also break down um, and have some byproducts that are you know, not very useful for that, for that system. Let's go back to this a little bit. Again, I'm offering you the physical sort of physics example, the biology example, and the chemistry example. I mean, you could say that they're all bio, but that's that's what we're going for. So I want to roll in this idea of um, delta G. So we're not going to exactly work with Gibbs free energy in here, but I will say plus and minus um, delta Gs, and it, and it should mean something to you in a moment. But consider the following examples. Person on high on a platform, a uh, concentration gradient, and uh, a molecule of atoms bound together. Okay, let's call it glucose. So, in all of these scenarios, these things have um, a high delta G, high, high Gibbs free energy. Right? So, there's more energy to do work in all three of those scenarios. Here's where it gets a little interesting. They're all less stable. Okay, so this one is sort of weird. Yeah, he's, he's less stable um, because if he goes to the end and just lets go, what happens? It falls, whereas that doesn't happen when it's water, right? So, the same thing here. These guys are not stable. They want to move from high to low. Believe it or not, too, the molecules that we create, like glucose, those atoms don't want to be bound together. I know I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit. There's no such thing as want, but the, the energy of it is such that they would be fine with breaking apart, right? You have to force them together. So because they're less stable, I'll add the following. They're more reactive. They're more likely to do something, especially when compared to the bottom, which we'll get to in a minute, okay? So less stable, more reactive, greater ability to do work. Okay. Uh, once that happens, once the, um, the person falls or the gradient is realized and the solute spreads out or the atoms fall apart and they're not in that molecular arrangement, um, you lose free energy. So the free energy of that particular or whatever system decreases. Okay. So all of the scenarios on the bottom are the opposite of that. There's less energy to do work. They're more stable, less reactive, and have the ability to do less work. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> Got to change that. All right, let's watch a video to um, break that down a little bit.
So we talk about energetics and when we get to thermodynamics, the, the notion of entropy comes into play. Now I didn't, I didn't fast forward to the, um, the Gibbs free energy equation just yet, but part of that involves terms like enthalpy, temperature, and Kelvins and entropy. Now we're, again, we're not gonna calculate those, but you should be able to understand that the amount of energy available to do work depends on what was the energy in the system and how much of it has been lost to chaos or disorganization at a certain temperature, okay? So um, for the um, physicists or the, the astrophysicists, which is like totally beyond me, I'll say the following, right? What is happening to our universe over time? Call up Mr. Spicer to see what's going on. Say it again, Ashwin. More disorder. More disorder. So the universe is actually like expanding from what I understand, right? It's becoming more disordered. It's becoming more uniform, right? More stable or less stable? So stability and disorder, it's, it's a little tricky, right? So it's entropy is increasing, but it's spreading out and becoming like more stable, which is really bizarre because throughout, well, as far as we know right now, in one pocket of our um, solar system, at least, I can't speak to the galaxy or the universe as a whole, but like all that's happening. And yet you see organisms. Why do organisms sort of refute that notion that everything is becoming more chaotic and spreading out and becoming more stable. What are what are we as organisms? Highly organized, right? Very little chaos, very little disorganization, however you want to say it. So we as organisms find a way to fight entropy. How? Through energy conversion, right? So I like this video for a couple of reasons. We'll talk about it. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this episode of SciShow. Go to brilliant.org slash SciShow to learn more about their 60 slot interactive course. One of the most fundamental ideas in physics is that the disorder of the universe is constantly increasing, which is funny because life, as we understand it, is pretty darn ordered. And it turns out life's inherent chemical makeup has been hacking the disorder of the universe for billions of years. To understand this disorder, otherwise known as entropy, imagine you have given a bag of glitters to a problem. Is all that glitter going to stay in the bag? No. No, probably not. And once it's out there, it's there forever. It's not going back in the bag. You're just going to have to make peace with glitter being a permanent feature of your floors, your furniture, maybe even your food and hair and skin. But your two-year-old force of nature will go be abiding by the second law of thermodynamics. The second law holds that entropy, which is a measure of how spread out the energy of the system is, is constantly increasing. Initially, your bag of glitter had low entropy because all the pieces of glitter were confined to one place creating a gold mine of concentrated energy. But once that bag is ripped open, that energy gets converted to movement as the glitter particles spread throughout the room. And after you finally manage to distract the child with an applesauce from a SciShow Kids video, the glitter will have come to rest on every imaginable surface. This is it. I can speak from experience that when it comes to two-year-olds and things like bags of glitter, it will open, it will spread out, <laughs> And um, the only way that you'll stop the chaos that, that's happening there is with an applesauce. <laughs> like the way, like the, the, the level that little kids are drawn to little applesauce pouches, it's remarkable. Like whoever puts applesauce in a pouch is brilliant. And I hope they're a, bil I hope they're a billionaire because it's like applesauce always saves the day. Say a higher entropy state for two reasons. One, the glitter pieces are no longer all switched together, and two, the energy of the bag has been spread out. And without energy, that glitter isn't going anywhere. Unfortunately, this is usually a one-way process. Energy never really just concentrates in one spot on its own. Like glitter never just jumps back into its bag. Except 
for organisms. So guys, what's so remarkable about this is like, yeah, all that is true. The glitter is going everywhere. It's, it's spreading out, everything's becoming chaos. And then there are like instances on earth, all of us, where every night we're able to put the glitter back in the bag. You are able to put the glitter back into the bag every night and, and not let the entropy overcome you, right? So the reason that we eat, you need to take in the, the energy that you can transform into ATP to do all the metabolism to fight the entropy, right? Like, you, I mean, that's, it's amazing, right? It's, it's just absolutely amazing. Yeah, cells basically make that happen. Like, for their entire existence, because life has mastered the art of concentrating energy, what you might call hacking entropy. The most obvious example is membranes, which are a universal requirement for cellular life. They are protective barriers around your cells, and they're made out of millions of lipid molecules, basically fat, organized in two parallel sheets, which, as far as entropy for the lipid goes, is basically a worst case scenario. They're crammed in like policy at a basic frat party, whereas entropy would favor them spreading out as much as possible. But unfortunately for them, lipids don't exist in a vacuum. They live in us, in big, fleshy sacks of mostly water. And it's unfortunate because while membrane lipids have hydrophilic or water moving heads, they're still fat with long hydrophobic or water giving tails. Practically, this means that when water molecules come in contact with a lipid tail, it kind of becomes frozen in a grid around them. This is a loss in entropy for the water molecules because they're not randomly distributed anymore. So it's a trade-off. The lipids have less entropy being packed in together, but the water has a lot more freedom to move around when it's not coming into contact with all those hydrophobic tails, which means the second law actually wins because there's more entropy in the water, but things still work out for the cell. This so that's another important part. If we get to cellular respiration and photosynthesis or any um, series of, of chemical reactions, any me metabolic reactions, you might look at certain steps of individual pathways and say, you know, that one's endergonic or exergonic, this one is, but overall the, the pathways themselves, we consider them um, are always one way or the other. I'm leaving that very generic for now, but um, and like what he's saying is like, that's not a violation of the second law of thermodynamics because ultimately entropy is increasing in that system, right? But you have to take into consideration what's happening to the phospholipids and what's happening to the water, right? So it, it still wins out. It's just, you have to consider like how much of it is the water, how much of it is the lipid. This is why membranes can assemble the you know, in the presence of water all on their own without any energy being put in. The relationship between hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules gets amplified when you think about protein. Because proteins can't just assemble themselves into a simple sheet like a member. Proteins are how cells do like nearly everything. But to do their job correctly, they need to take the proper shape. And that's harder than it sounds. Or it should be. Every protein starts out as a linear strand of amino acids that has to fold into an incredibly specific three-dimensional shape. And there are of long ways you can fold from these bent ribbons to end up with a non-working protein. A researcher named Cyrus Rosenthal was postulated that if an avid protein randomly tried out all of these long shapes, it would take more time than life has existed on Earth. We're pretty sure they managed to fold correctly somewhat faster than that. So the question is, how do these proteins consistently not only get it right, but do it fast? Scientists began wondering if protein folding might be able to fast forward the early steps using entropy. In the 1980s, they proposed something known as the molten globule state. In subsequent studies, have provided evidence that this is really happening. A molten globule is an intermediate form similar to the protein's final human shape, in which hydrophobic amino acids essentially fall into a flexible blob. And if you, if you look at this, this um this weird graph, right? Like proteins in their unfolded state have lots of entropy, right? The folding of the protein decreases that. So the, the fact that we have all these thousands of proteins in a certain shape, then in and of itself is like a miracle in battling entropy, right? And then you kind of factor in like, what are the chemical reactions? What are the things that these 
these proteins do. And all of its like metabolic pathways are converting energy from one form to another. As a center of a baby protein away from the water. The idea behind this model is similar to membrane disease. If you cram most of the hydrophobic amino acids into the center of a protein, it allows the water molecules to move freely. And even though this means the amino acids are then restricted in how they can move, the net gain of entropy for the water should still be favorable. So, same idea, second law still wins out, even though the amino acids are restricted and not not uh, allowed to increase in entropy overall the water still is around it so the second law still still wins out we do see a lot of proteins that keep their hydrophobic regions tucked away it makes sense that that's how they start folding most importantly this would also partly explain how proteins fold so fast they skip the bunch of steps by eliminating a bunch of wrong scenarios at some point in trillions and trillions of years Entropy might be the undoing of life altogether, as everything in the universe becomes completely uniform. But for the last four billion years or so, it's made life possible, which is a little bit paradoxical, but definitely very cool. If only it could put the glitter back in the bag. If you need a reason. So um, I think that's I think that's fascinating, right? You put the glitter back into the bag every night. What happens when entropy wins? You're dead. You're dead. So we'll save the depressing death stuff for the next class. Um, <laughs> okay. So I want to introduce a. Um, some additional definitions of certain types of reactions here. I want to introduce exergonic and endergonic. Okay, so just looking at these figures, um, really quickly, an exergonic reaction is one that releases energy. An endergonic reaction is one that takes on energy. So you can see that in the following ways. So for an exergonic reaction, the reactants have more energy than the products. Okay, so we can see that from here to here, um, that's the difference um, with the starting materials and the ending materials. So it's released, whereas in endergonic reactions, you start here and you end here. So which of these is anabolic and which of these is catabolic? We'll start with exergonic. Catabolic, and these ones, endergonic. So what is this whole delta? Uh, G mean. What is it showing? For exergonic, delta G is less than zero. Why would it make sense that you'd have a negative delta G in an exergonic reaction? Because energy has been released. Yeah. So in a situation like that, the, the go to for me is like um, ATP hydrolysis, right? So we talked about that. Um, well, what would your delta G then be if you're investing energy into a system like with this endergonic reaction? Positive. positive right so that's as complicated as we'll get with with free energy right so if it goes up you know your your reactants have had energy added to them so the product would be more energetic they'd have the ability to do uh, work okay one other thing with exergonic reactions so exergonic reactions are spontaneous what does that mean so you don't need to put energy into this system for this to happen. Now that might not cut it for living things. Um, we might need this reaction to happen at a faster rate than it would without energy invested into it. So in that case has given us a certain type of protein that can speed those sorts of things up. What is that protein? An enzyme? Good. So we'll get to enzymes next time. But here, spon uh, spontaneous reactions occur without energy. But if you're going to go from low to high and um, have a positive delta G, this means you have to invest energy, right? So energy has to go into that system for that to occur. Okay. So, um, okay. 
So yeah, so you you know this is in the formula sheet for AP Bio. Again, I've never seen students have to calculate it. It's more conceptual. Okay. Um, Delta S being that entropy. Okay. So let's consider a couple of scenarios for fun. You have here a compost heap, a little baby chicken being born, somebody taking sand art and wiping it away, and a human hamster ball rolling down a hill. Has anybody ever been in one of these? No. I, I, I might get in one if it was flat and I could just roll around. I don't know that I'd be pushed down a hill in it. <laughs> Although if, it's, if they could guarantee that it was that pushing me that whatever I hit, I'd be okay, then maybe. But I would just see myself in spiral. You can do it on water, right? They have those. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just hope that it doesn't have a leak, right? <laughs> but that's like, yeah, that's. Yeah. All right, so let's consider this. Would this be considered? Um, what what kind of process would that be considered? Endergonic. Why is that? Because energy is going to be spread. So you think that compost is sort of like growing? You're right. There's like plants in there, but I would argue a compost. So you guys are from Pittsburgh, so you guys don't know how to compost. Um, <laughs> that's not like a Pittsburgh thing. Um, I lived in Vermont and New Hampshire prior to coming here, and like every house had a compost like. There's like trash can, recycling, compost. So compost is like where you put all your organic matter. So you peel some potatoes in the compost, you chop some carrots, the greens, they go into um, compost. So you're basically dumping that out there. Um, and there is a compost heap in the, in the secret garden, by the way. Um, I'm not asking you to like bring <laughs> potato scraps into school, but um, yeah, so that's just sort of, it's rotting and it, and it basically can be used as a, as a really, um, good fertilizer afterwards. Yeah. So for for A, uh, for like the compost process and what does that do most likely? The kind of stuff that happens like without any of this energy, that's like the spontaneous process. What does that be exergonic? Yeah, it is. Yeah, that that one is an is an example of exergonic. Um, the, they're going to break down without input of energy, um, and you know you're going to have things like if, for example, that's you know a bunch of potato peels. The starch in it will break down, and it'll break down into monosaccharides, and that gives the saving block. What about the chicken being born? This is my an interesting example, my favorite one. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a real thinker, right? But I, I would I would basically remove, yeah, the eggshell is a barrier that needs energy to crack through. But like the the development of a of a young animal is it endergonic or exergonic? Do you guys remember Robin? Was Robin here last year? Yeah, yeah, yeah Robin was here last year. So Robin and I had like a a, a year long ongoing debate about this picture. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, and 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 Robin had his information, and he was like, and so it made me think about it. But I still think that I know the answer, and I, I think it's endergonic, right? So why is that? You kind of mentioned it, right? Energy invest has to be invested in the in the chick, right, for it to come together to be like a walking, moving thing comprised of proteins and lipids and stuff like that. Where, where do chicks get their energy to do that? Like, it's not like a placental mammal that's hooked up to its mom for nutrients. Well, then where does the egg, right? You just lay the egg and it becomes a chicken, right? <laughs> so how? That's my question then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, when you crack an egg open for breakfast, this stuff comes spilling out, right? Like, what is that stuff in there besides delicious breakfast? It's the stuff that would have gone to like feeding and developing the chick, right? 
um, part of it becomes like, you know, the proteins to assemble the chicken, then the yolk is like feeding the, the, the organism, right? Um, do humans have yolks? <laughs> so you wanna you wanna hear something crazy? Humans have a little vestigial yolk sac as they're developing, just like their tail, right? So yeah, there's a tiny yolk sac, I and mean, it's not utilized for energy because we've gone a different route, obviously. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's like in evolution, a lot of those things carry over. If it's not decreasing your fitness, um, it might still be there, right? Like the, um, you guys remember freshman year? I don't know if I brought this up as an example, but like uh, whale evolution, right? Whales lost their legs, but they still have like hip bones and pelvis inside from, from their former legs because selection stops when it decreases fitness, right? I mean, so. You know, once the, the, the little stumpy legs were gone, who cares what happens on the inside unless it's decreasing your fitness. So I don't know. We will um, pick it up here next time with um, enzymes and how they lower activation energy to make reactions happen. Okay. So we'll take a quiz and you'll be on your way. Adina, All right. Hi, okay. What was that again? Stand by. I'll send you your quiz. All right. No problem. Sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll still be online until I get the quiz.